Let's listen to the word of God found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 12, in, in its fullness, both encouraging and challenging. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God as we have taught you. You live this way already, and we encourage you to do so even more. For you remember that we taught you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. God's will is for you to be holy. So stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor. Not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. Never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this matter by violating his wife. For the Lord avenges all such sins as we have solemnly warned you before. God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. But we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other, for God himself has taught you to love one another. Indeed, you already show your love for all the believers throughout Macedonia. Even so, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you to love them even more. Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others. All right, you may be seated. I just want to add on to the thank you that Johnny said. Yesterday was a beautiful day here at Riverwood, seeing the body of Christ at work and uh, opening our front door to the community. So thank you again for all those who are part of that. A lot of work goes into those two hours, um, but it's well worth it. And uh, just thank you for being a part of that. Well, this morning we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to be talking about the topic of work and so I thought to get us in the mood of talking about work, we could uh, play a little game. It's going to be kind of this play a song, fill in the rest of the line. And what I have done, I've chosen three songs from culture, uh, and they all speak about work. And so these songs are from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Does that pretty much include everybody? Well, there might be some who are younger than that, who are who were born after that, but these are songs you might want to pay attention to. So Garth has been so kind to help us out with this, so he's going to sing the song and uh, stop, and we'll fill it in as he goes. So, all right, we're ready. So don't hang me out to dry here. You need everybody <laughs> to sing when it's your turn, all right? <laughs> you load 16 tons, what do you get? Good crap. Peter, don't call me cause I can't go. I owe my life to the company store. All right, that was good. That's great. Yes. I've heard that three times now. Uh, service three is clearly on top of this. We'll see how we'll see how number two goes. All right. Stumble to the kitchen, pour myself a cup of ambition, yawn and stretch and trying to come to life. Jump into the shower and the blood starts pumping. Out on the streets, the traffic starts jumping. The folks like me out working nine to five. Ready, here you go. Working nine to five, what a way to make a living. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Wait a second. I give that about a C on that one. It's funny, after the second service, someone came up to me, like they want to talk to me about the service, and they're like, Garth needs to work on his Dolly Parton. <laughs> so, so. It's hard to imitate Dolly Parton. All right, all right. There's not, one more song, here we go. This one makes me blush, so we got to talk <laughs> after this one. This is, this is 
Well, I've been working in this factory now about 15 years. And all this time I watched my woman you know drowning in a pool of tears. Well, I've seen a lot of good folks die and had a lot of bills to pay. And I give the shirt right off of my back if I had the guts to say, take this. I ain't working here no more. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's not like your thought on work, is it? That's my boss. <laughs> well, I gave that to him on Thursday, so thanks, Garth, for helping us out on that. So that was good. But it proves to you that if we go into our culture and look and see how they view work, we come out thinking that work is what? Evil, Evil bad, a drudgery. Why do we have to do it? We're just working nine to five, and it's horrible, and all of these things about work. This is what our culture tells us. And if we're not too careful, we too can be swept along in that same kind of idea where it's all about working for the weekend, right? Yeah, that's a good song too, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so it all becomes a, really where work is something we try to avoid and we don't like at all. And the question we're going to look at this morning is, is that what God thinks about work? Okay, we know what our culture says, but what does he think about work? That is why we've gathered and so what we're going to do together is build a theology. Theology is just a fancy word that says, what does God think? What are his opinions? A theology of work this morning. And we're going to delve into this idea. Where did this idea come from? Who came up with this idea? And what should our approach be to our work now, work is a very broad term. Some of us get paid and some of us don't. Some of us are retired. Some of us are students. But all of us are called, we're going to see, to this idea of, of work. And what should our thoughts and approach be to this? So we've been on this journey together for a number of weeks through the book of Genesis. And we've been, uh, this idea has been exploring our origins. That's been the title you see it on the bulletin, uh, Origins. And so origins of everything that we believe come from Genesis. We can kind of draw traces and draw these lines back to this book. And so we should know it. And we said we want to know what the origins of God are. Who is he? Uh, the one who created. We looked at that a number of weeks ago. We then looked at the origins of man created in his image, image bearers. Last week, we looked at this idea of the origins of marriage, man and woman. Where do we get that from? All the way back into Genesis we went. And for this week, we're going to do something very similar. We're going to be going back into the early parts of Genesis to see what do we say when, it, when we talk about this topic of work. So just a reminder, if you have a question about anything that's been going on in this Genesis series, please use the cards that are in the seat backs in front of you that have origins on them, or you can also text uh, your question as well, 22333, uh, that's the number, and uh, it'll come on the slides as we are kind of going through. So, all right, so where do we begin on this conversation of building a theology of work? Well, we have to at least get to the beginning to say we realize that work is hard. And work is something that isn't always easy. There are times where work is described as toil, and work is frustrating. We try to do something that isn't just right. It's not turning out right. And so there is frustration. We want to know that that is definitely a part of work. And the strongest passage that we go to is actually in Genesis that tells us this. And that would be Genesis chapter 3. And the theology of Genesis 3 is that sin entered into the world. And because of sin, there also then became death and lots of other effects of sin and death. And some of that affects work. And for many, we assume that is our theology of work. We go back to Genesis 3 and we're like, oh, work. Can't stand it. It's, it's hard. It's difficult. 
But before Genesis 3, there's Genesis 1 and 2. And that will also give us, I think, more insights into where work really originates. You see, if we just have a Genesis 3 opinion of work, then work is horrible. It's all about the weekend. It's all about the money. And I'm making enough to start doing the things I really like to do because I'm trying to avoid this thing that gets in the way. And is that really what God thinks about work? Well, that's what we're going to really delve into this morning. So we know what our culture says, but what does God's word say? So if you have your Bible, let's open up to Genesis chapter 2. And uh, I've been telling people at every hour, if you come to Riverwood and you don't have a Bible, we would love to put one in your hands. We would love to get the word of God in your hands so you can read it, so you can see it for yourself. Take the Bible home, read it, and, uh, and see how God is speaking um, through his word into your life. So again, we're going to be in Genesis 1 and 2, uh, second chapter we're going to begin, and, uh, and again, see how we can build out this theology of work. So it says this, chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all, all, all the host of them, and on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his, here it is again, work that he had done in creation. All right, so this is where we come across the first mention of this word, work, in Scripture. In chapter 1, we see that God is up to lots of things. He's making this. He's creating that. And then at the very end, we see in chapter, or in chapter 2 here, we see that there is a word that is used to summarize all of his actions. And the word that is chosen by the author is work. Now, this Hebrew word of work is, is a very common word we see in the rest of scriptures uh, to describe bringing form to formlessness, to, to bringing uh, order and organization to things that are chaotic. It's a, it's a very common word, which is interesting because you would think the author in describing God's actions would use something much holier or something, something much bigger. There must be a better word to describe God who, who speaks and creates out of nothing, or who takes things from the ground and, and forms. There must be, but no. The author uses this very specific word to talk about God's actions. God works. And so this is where our theology begins. We start with this statement. It's very simple. God is a worker. Now, you might think, well, that seems pretty simple. That seems pretty straightforward. But in the ancient world, this is, this is much different. For the ancient gods, work was way below them. They weren't going to engage in work. That's what humans did. They had other things in the spirit world and many things that they were off doing. Work was not something that they did. But this is exactly how Scripture dis describes Yahweh. He is someone who enters into creation. He gets his proverbial hands dirty in creation. He picks up the dust and he forms it. He is intimately involved in his creation, which is remarkable to think about. It's just four words. God is a worker, but those are incredible words to begin a theology on work. All right, so this is where we start. Let's continue to add on to this phrase. We're going to be uh, in verse 4. This is what it says. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the heaven made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, 
and there was no man to work the ground. All right, chapter 2 here in Genesis, the gears have shifted a bit. The first four verses we read really go with chapter 1. They're really the conclusion of the first creation account. And so it's a little bit of a, a gear shift as we go into these verses. But basically we're seeing a second creation account. It's the same creation he's talking about. A different vantage point, different details are brought out. And what we see here is that God, the worker, is taking things that had no form and, and no shape, and he's bringing shape and form to the world. This chaotic mess is now taking on a very specific look to it. The heavens and the earth, the sky and the land. But this is what I find very interesting. If you look at verse 5, God has created a world that is screaming out for, and that is in desperate need of more, what? Work. Well, that is interesting. A world with great amounts of potential. That's how he created it. Just waiting to be unleashed. No plants had sprung up yet. Why is that? Well, there's no rain, but there's also, notice what he says, no man to work the ground. So God, the worker, works in a world, and he works and he works, and what he comes up with is a world that needs more work a world that is not done with work, but a world that is filled with work to be done. Which leads us to the next piece of theology that we add on. God is a worker who formed a world needing work. Now, before we move on to the next piece of theology on work, I know what you're thinking. Why would God create a world that needs more work what kind of idea is that? Why didn't he create a world that needs more leisure, right? A world that needs more golf or whatever leisure thing you're thinking of, fishing or whatever. Why didn't he create a world that needs more of that? Well, we're going to get to that next week because we, with a theology of work, you also need a theology of rest. And we're going to talk about that next week. Come back. But for this week, we're talking about work. And so if we go into this idea of work and we think that work is bad, we all need more vacations and more leisure, that's really what this world needs. But that's not what's going on here. Notice that the things in, in the first two chapters as God is creating his world, he steps back and he calls it good. On day one, it is good. Day two, he gets all the way to the end and he looks at creation, he calls it very good. And so these are the true origins of work that we're looking at. Genesis 3 will play a part, but Genesis 2 really speaks to the true origins. That work is not a necessary evil, that God just kind of slipped in on us. The world is really about vacation, and he just slipped us in kind of the side door. Oh yeah, you're going to work too, by the way. No, the author has none of that in mind. Work in its origins was an integral part of paradise. And you're thinking, wait a second. <laughs> Let me chew on that for a little bit. Work in its origins is an integral part of paradise? Really? It's true. Speaking of paradise, do you know where the rest of the story is going? If we went all the way to the end of the Bible, into Revelation, for all of those who know Christ and who trust in him, do you know where the story is going? The, the story isn't going to his people who are going to be floating on clouds and playing harps and just flying around in leisure. The rest of the story is going to end in a new earth, a new heaven, a new Jerusalem is coming. And if, think about this for a second. If work was an integral part of paradise at the beginning, 
don't you think that work is going to be an integral part of paradise for eternity? All right, well, let's get back onto our original trail. So we have a God who, who is a worker in a world that is in need of work, which then leads us to the next part of our theology. Remember, something's kind of missing so far. It's not all complete yet. Let's see what God has in mind. I think you might see where this is going. Verse 7 of chapter 2. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground. There it is, God of the worker again, getting his hands dirty. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Now, if we drop down to verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to, here it is, work it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. What is God's answer? You, and you, and you, and you, and me. Mankind is his answer. From the dust of the ground was formed people, a person who would be placed in the garden who would then be tasked to, do you see the words? To work it, to preserve it, to keep it. If we go back into chapter 1, words like this, to subdue, to have dominion over. That's our job. Unlike the other things of creation, like animals, see, animals have been called to team and multiply. You see, mankind is different. Our charge is different. We have a unique DNA that includes this idea of working. Tim Keller, who is a pastor, writer, theologian, he has a book uh, written about work. And in the book, he has this quote that gets really to the heart of what work being a very fabric of our lives. Listen to what he says. Work is as much a basic human need as food, beauty, rest, friendship, prayer, and sexuality. It is not simply medicine, but food for our soul. Without meaningful work, we sense significant inner loss and emptiness. People who are cut off from work because of physical or other reasons, quickly discover how much they need work to thrive emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Did you catch that? It's true. We need to work. Our design is is built that way, to bring form to things that don't have form to bring order to things that are chaotic. That's, that's part of who we are, to find satisfaction in that kind of work. And so to add to our theology of work, we ness, here's the other part. God is a worker, we've seen that, who formed a world needing work, we've got that, who formed man who needs to work, who formed man who needs to work. You see, work is good. It's a good thing. It's not just a manic Monday. Wish it were Sunday, because that's our fun day. I think is a worship song, by the way. Yeah. But work is a good thing. Yesterday, we had three tons of sand poured out into the parking lot. And uh, we had a sculptor who came in and beautifully crafted what you see out there. And as I was watching her, I was thinking about this sermon and thinking about this whole idea of work, bringing something, a lump of sand on a parking lot that is formless and bringing form to it and watching her work and watching her step back and taking satisfaction and making everything just right. 
It's a beautiful picture of exactly what, this is, what work is designed to do. A world that needs to be formed and people who are right there who have that need to bring form to it. But the next question could be, where is all of this headed? What is the point of all of this work? And if we then go through the rest of Scripture, beyond Genesis, we fill out the rest of our theology of work. You see, because the rest of Scripture has lots to say about work. You even read, heard it read this morning from Thessalonians that our hands should not be idle. Paul has a lot of other things to say about work. The rest of the Old Testament has parts that says about work. And as we see the story continuing, Adam and Eve multiply, multiply and are filling the earth with lots of people. Again, this earth that needs form and people who need work. And so we see that this is the very basis of of cultures that are forming. Human societies are, are gathering enclaves of people are are together, and they are advancing together. And it's a beautiful thing to watch because God designed it that way. And work is is a great thing as cultures then advance and come up with new inventions and continue to better themselves at the same time reflecting the one who is image they have been made in. And so we add to our statement on a theology of work to say this, God is a worker, yes, who formed a world needing work, obvious, who formed man who needs to work, yes, we agree, to reflect him and to serve others. That's what work is all about. Not this drudgery, this thing we have to do, I can't wait till it's over, but something that is a blessing in the lives of God's creation. Men and women who have been called to reflect God through their work. All right, so the question then becomes, what does this mean for us? If we look at, now we have our theology statement here. What do we do with it? How does it affect us? How does it change us? Should we do things differently? What should we, how should we approach? You see, we know, again, we know where our culture, we know their voice. This is God's voice, and it should then have a bearing on changing how we approach work. And the conversation can go in lots of different places. The first one is this, really on the front of our mind and our motive and our heart. And this is the question. Do we really believe that work is a good thing? Do we, do we believe it? You see, it's so easy to hear what the world is saying, but do you believe that your work is good? Whether you are someone who sees patients or you're someone who teaches third grade math or someone who is, uh, works at Kent State or someone who makes donuts, someone who's an electrician, someone who's a plumber, someone who's a police officer, someone who, who takes care of their kids at home, someone who is a student. Do we see our work as good and important? When I was in college uh, one summer, I filed... Um, medical records all summer, 40 hours a week, alphabetical order in these huge rows of just medical records. And so you would drive the cart around, and you would see which one was next, and you'd drive to that spot, and you would file it in. And in the, in the moment, I'm thinking, this is so stupid. Why? This work is horrible. <laughs> but that was when I was stupid. But now reflecting on that job, I'm thinking, wow, that is important. Because if nurses can't find that record, if you just kind of slip it in wherever and they cannot find it, they then cannot give it on to the doctor who then needs to sit there with the patient and help them in very specific ways. It's an important job. All work is good. All work is important. There's a writer in, in, uh, 
His name is Brother Lawrence. He was a monk in the 1600s. He wrote different things, but one of his strongest theologies was on this front of work. You know what he did all day in the monastery? He peeled potatoes. But it talks about how he does it, how he did it unto the Lord and worship to him. Very mundane things. You might not think your job is that important, but also what Brother Lawrence would say is this, your job is sacred. See, a lot of times we like to draw these lines of sacred and non-sacred. And what you do is, non, is non-holy, unholy, and only people in clergy do important things. Nonsense! That distinction is never there in Genesis. All work is unto him. All work is sacred. All work is important. We reflect him. And some people put sermons together, and some people make donuts, and some people do lots of other things. All of it is important and good. Please hear that, because we need to be the champions on Monday mornings who are going off to work saying, yes, this is a good thing. You see, the world wants to say, oh, just another Monday. But we need to be the ones who say, yes, and isn't it a blessing to go and to work? And maybe you're, you get paid for your job. Maybe you don't. Maybe, again, you're retired, or maybe it's going off to school tomorrow morning at 6.30 in the morning. That is your job. And so this first challenge is really on the front of attitude and mind. And the second challenge is really the simple question of this. How well are you working? See, the first part of motive builds into the second piece. How well do you do your job? You see, that's important because if you see that word down there, we reflect him wherever we go. And whether you're a a podiatrist or whether you're someone who is a garbage truck driver, you reflect him in the things that you do. How well do you do your job? Do you do it to the best of your abilities? Do you do it with integrity? Do you do it with hard work to get the job done right? That's important to God. Because the world is watching, and they look, and they see And they wonder, why do you work so hard? And it tells a story. And it's not so much your story, but it tells the story of the one whom you reflect. And so we ask the simple question from our theology of work, how well do you work? Or are you just kind of putting it in until Friday afternoon, and then you're out of there? And No, we are to be the ones who work well. And off of that, we could have lots of other side conversations about how do we treat our coworkers. You see, God has planted you in a very specific place in that office at the University of Akron to be around other people or wherever you work and to have interactions with them and to maybe speak truth into their lives. That biology class that you hate, maybe God has placed you right there in that seat for a very specific purpose. How do we work? Are we caring about those who we work with? And we can even, if we had more time, go into more conversation about how much we make in our job. Are we trusting God will take care of us as we faithfully use the money we're paid to then take care of our families and to, to do all the things that we need to do with money. It's a trust. It's, again, it's a trust issue. Trusting him. There's a beautiful verse in Colossians 3.23. It says this, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance of, as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. Your work matters. It's important. Because wherever you work, God is there. You are working with him. He's a worker. And so are we. Let me pray for us.
Dear God, we thank you for your word that challenges us, that we come to each and every week. You see, it's so easy to listen to culture, but we want to listen to your voice. So thank you for speaking truth into our lives, challenging us in every way, and especially with our work. May we have a a renewed perspective. For some, may you change their minds on how they work. For some, I pray that you would allow them to see that they need to work with more passion as a representative of you. May it all be pleasing in your sight because we know that we are working heartily to adorn you, the one whose image we reflect. Again, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray these things in your name. Amen.